of you might have seen in clinic at the Kiwi, or you may have um, come across some of my colleagues um, more locally to yourselves. So um, you may already have an idea about um, an idea of what speech and language therapy is and what we do. Um, but there are a few questions that I'm hoping to answer for you today. So the questions are, what is speech and language therapy? Why am I talking to you today? How does the swallow work? What is dysphagia and how is it managed? What is reflux and how is it managed? So speech and language therapists um, work with a wide array, people with a wide array of communication difficulties. We provide assessment and intervention for a range of speech, language and voice disorders. So this might be what you most typically think about when you hear about speech and language therapy. But we also work with people who have difficulty with their swallow. And this is because we understand how the mouth and the throat work for us to be able to both communicate and swallow effectively and what we can do if anyone has a little bit of trouble with this. So I'm talking to you. A number of people with WS can experience difficulty with their swallow and this may be because the brain to the muscles are corrupted or because of an increased difficulty in coordinating breathing with swallowing and it can also arise um, due to uh, reduced coordination of movement or ataxia. So I'll be explaining how the swallow works, how you can identify particular swallowing difficulties and how speech and language therapists can work with you to, um, to manage this. So I'll just take you through the normal swallow. This is made up of four different stages. We have the pre-oral stage, the oral stage, the pharyngeal stage and the esophageal stage. So the pre-oral stage encompasses everything that happens before your food and drink reaches your mouth. This includes seeing and smelling your food and drink, producing enough saliva, using your hands to bring the item to your mouth and using the muscles um, that control your lips and your jaw to open your mouth to receive the food and drink. Okay, next we have the oral stage of swallowing. And this is everything that happens when the food and drink is inside your mouth. So we need to have a strong lip seal in order to stop anything falling out the front. Um, and we need to use our tongue and other muscles to manipulate the food or drink to form a cohesive bolus um, and transfer it from the front of our mouth towards the back. And throughout this time, our airway is open and our soft palate or our velum just here is lowered okay and our airway is just here i can send these out if the pictures are a little bit small i can send these slides out after okay all right so we come on to the pharyngeal stage so once the food or drink has been transferred towards the back of our mouth a swallow is triggered and this is no longer um, under voluntary control. So the pharyngeal phase is um, all reflexive or involuntary, um, whereas everything before this moment has been under voluntary control and we've been consciously aware of what we've been doing. So once the swallow is triggered, our soft palate or velum rises up and seals off the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. Okay, I'll just get my mouse off just here. So this stops any food or drink going up into our nasal cavity and coming down through our nose. Okay, um, our throats or our pharynx contract and push um, and our, sorry, our pharynx contracts and our larynx rises up, closes off the airway. Um, so this means we are holding our breath when, we, when we're swallowing. Um, the muscle at the top of our esophagus relaxes and allows the bolus to pass down into the esophagus. Okay, so just come down here. If you have a look through all these pictures. All right, and this moves us on to the esophageal stage of swallowing. 
our airway is once open again, allowing us to breathe freely. And the muscles within our esophagus move in the formation of waves. Um, and this is called peristalsis. The bolus is pushed down um, in a wave formation all the way down into our stomach. All right. So everything I've described so far is how a typical swallow works. Each stage of the swallow is important in order to trigger a swallow successfully. And an interruption at any of these stages may result in a less effective swallow. And this can be for a wide variety of reasons. So an interruption or difficulty in swallowing is known as dysphagia, it's the medical term. And dysphagia can occur at any stage of the swallow that I've just spoken about. So you can have oral dysphagia, pharyngeal dysphagia, or a combination of both, esophageal dysphagia. And signs or symptoms of this um, can include coughing, when eating and drinking, choking, a wet or gurgly sounding voice after you've had a drink, um, repetitive chest infections, or aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration is um, when particles of food or drink go down into our windpipe rather than our food pipe um, and they can sit in our lungs and cause an infection. So that's what aspiration pneumonia is. Um, other symptoms can also include pain on swallowing and the feeling of something stuck in the throat and this can also lead to um, a reduced inclination to eat or drink. Um, so you're not getting enough food or drink in because it, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. Okay. Um, some people may also notice that thicker drinks such as milkshakes or smoothies reduce some of these symptoms. So they might notice that they're coughing when they're having water or squash or tea. But if they have a smoothie, or something a little bit thicker, it might reduce that coughing. And I'll come on to the reasons for that as well. So if somebody is uh, experiencing symptoms of dysphagia, they'll likely be referred to a speech and language therapist. Um, we will complete our assessment and um, we'll have a look at how the muscles around the mouth and around the throat are moving um, and see if, if we can gauge sort of reasons for the difficulties that are being experienced. So typically a speech and language therapist will assess an individual with um, various consistencies and textures of food and drink um, to determine the safest consistencies um, for that person. And the initial assessment involves um, observation and palpation. So we'll have a feel of, of how the swallow is moving. Um, we'll just place our fingers on the front of somebody's neck um, so we can have a feel, see how much movement there is. Um, and we'll observe for any other any other symptoms that are going on whilst eating and drinking. So we might notice that coughing occurs with certain types of food and drink, but not others. Um, if we feel that a more objective assessment is required, we can um, use FEES, which is fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. And this is where a small camera is put up, put up um, your nose and it hangs down sort of the back of your throat. And this is used to sort of see how um, the anatomy is moving and what the sensation is like um, and how our swallow responds to food or drink. Okay, we can also use video fluoroscopy. So that's like a, that's a moving x-ray of your swallow. So we get to see, see you from side on um, and see how the food or drink moves through your mouth and, and down your throat and we can identify whether there's um, traces of aspiration happening and we can also um, see if there's a difference between um, consistencies of food and drink and whether any strategies are helpful as well during that assessment. So once we've identified um, what is happening we can provide advice, strategies and modify food and drink aiming to make eating and drinking safer, easier and more enjoyable. There is also the option of swallowing therapy, and this will be tailored to each individual after assessment. So we look at factors such as positioning, ensuring that the individual eating and drinking is in a comfortable and upright position as possible, and that they're able to use utensils well. 
So there's a wide range of adapted crockery and cutlery available that can increase independence at mealtimes. Um, this includes winged cups, weighted cutlery, non-slip mats and plate guards. Um, and this is useful if dexterity is an issue. Um, we can have a look at different options there. Postural strategies are also used to increase airway protection and avoid anterior loss when eating or drinking. So this can include turning your head to one side, um, tilting your head to uh, either side and tucking your chin down to your chest. Um, Manoeuvres and therapy exercises can be specifically advised for individuals after assessment. Um, and it's important that these are only used if advised by your speech and language therapist as while they're very helpful for some people, they can be very unhelpful for other people. Okay. So as well as those options, um, food and drink can be modified to manage the symptoms that somebody is experiencing. And this means that we'll prepare food and drink to a certain consistency or texture. And there is an international standard for diet and fluid modification known as IDSI. That's the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. And this framework describes um, different levels of food and drink and how they should be prepared um, to best suit the individual. Okay, so if swallowing um, is a very acute problem or something that's persisting for a little bit longer and somebody isn't able to manage the, um, the nutritional requirements through food and drink, um, we can look at non-oral nutrition. So this is something that um, nutrition nurses and dietitians will be involved with and um, they look at tube feeding. So this can be a little tube that's placed through your nose directly into your stomach or into your intestines in order for somebody to get the nutritional requirements. And this doesn't mean that they're um, not able to eat or drink at the same time. It can be for some people, for, can be the case for some people, but not for everybody. Um, just depends on the situation. And finally, um, surgical intervention can be used. Um, so this will typically be under gastroenterology. So if somebody is having um, ongoing difficulties at the esophageal level. Sometimes people can experience strictures or narrowings of the esophagus um, and surgical procedures can be used to, to manage this. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit more about diet and fluid modification and why we do this. So changing the consistency of someone's food and drink um, is useful and can compensate for any weakness or in coordination of muscles. It can make chewing, um, clearing your mouth and swallowing easier. It can increase somebody's independence and their quality of life. And it can also reduce any pain, any discomfort and risk of aspirational malnutrition. So this is the IDSI framework. It's quite a small image. So as I said, I can forward my slides on to Tracy who can distribute after. Um, and I've also included the link at the bottom of this screen, which um, explains everything in much more detail, um, but it's not relevant for everybody. So I'm not gonna go through it in too much detail today, but it's there if required. Um, so I'm gonna take you through a brief um, explanation of each level for you. So firstly we have level zero which is thin fluids, your normal drinks, so um, just your water, tea, coffee, anything that flows quite quickly and you can drink from any kind of cup, any kind of straw. Um, we use thickening powder when we make thicker drinks and I'll be showing you that later. Okay so um, level one is slightly thick fluids and this is very slightly thicker than water and requires a little more effort um, to drink through a straw but you can still get it through a straw quite nicely. Level two is your mildly thick fluids, um, flows off the spoon but moves a little bit slower, um, it's sippable and um, you can get it through a straw with a little bit more effort. Level three 
is your moderately thick fluids and this also corresponds to a liquidized diet so they'll be the same consistency and this is something that can be drunk from a cup um, it's very difficult to get this through a straw very tricky um, you can also have it from a spoon so if you think of maybe consistency of quite a of your average soup maybe a canned soup um, this will probably be about the consistency of a liquidized diet or moderately thick fluids and it's important that it's nice and smooth with no no lumps or bumps moving on to level four this is your extremely thick fluid and also your puree diet so they'll be the same consistency and it's hard to drink this from a cup um, you're not going to get it through a straw and it's usually had from a spoon um, and if you were to pop it on your spoon and tilt your spoon it would come off in one in one dollop um, nice and smooth again no lumps or bumps it's also not sticky and it doesn't require any chewing so if you think of quite a thick yogurt texture that would um, that would be your level four level five is minced and moist diet so as described it's nice and soft nice and moist um, there's no separate thin liquid um, there'll be some small lumps and um, it has four millimeters wide specified for the adult population um, but if you sort of picture a uh, fork the little lumps would be able to fit through the prongs of the fork and they can be easily squashed with your tongue so you need to do a little bit of chewing of this texture, um, but it's still very, very soft. Okay, moving on to level six. So this is your soft and bite-sized diet texture. And as described, all um, food should be cut into nice bite-sized pieces um, about the size of your thumbnail for a rough gauge. Again, the measurements I've got here are for the adult population, so that's 1.5 by 1.5 centimetres, the size of your thumbnail roughly, um, and they're a little bit smaller for um, paediatric populations. Um, again, the food is nice and soft and tender, no separate thin liquid or hard lumps, and it can be mashed or broken down with a fork, and you definitely need to do some chewing with this. Level seven is your regular diet. So your normal everyday foods, various textures, they could be hard and crunchy, naturally softer, and there's no size limit. Um, there can be mixed consistencies in this, in this uh, category as well. And there is also a group of foods that we label transitional food items. So these are foods that start as one texture. Um, it can be firm or solid and change into another texture when moisture, um, so this could be water or, or your saliva, um, is applied or when there is a change in temperature, um, so when the food becomes warmer in your mouth. So if you think about um, certain types of crisps, you have your skips or quavers, if you held them in your mouth for a while, they would melt down without any, any need to chew those. Um, and your tongue can easily break those foods down once they've been um, altered by moisture or temperature. Okay. I'm just going to take you through some of the high risk foods. So these are the food groups that um, people most typically have difficulty with. Um, and I've definitely spoken to a few of you in clinic about this before. Um, so they're foods that are most difficult to manipulate in your mouth and most difficult to swallow. So these will be stringy and fibrous textures. Um, so picture your foods that have um, sort of strings running through them, like your pineapple, runner beans, celery and lettuce, um, as well as vegetable and fruit skins. Um, so this includes beans and grapes. Mix, mixed consistency foods. So these will be foods that have um, a solid component and a liquid component. Um, so if you think about a soup that has lumps in it or um, cereal that doesn't blend of the milk. So Weetabix can make a nice, um, it's a single consistency food once it's soaked, whereas your muesli isn't going to soak well with your milk and you'll have those different consistencies. And it's just a, 
trickier consistency to manipulate because we will swallow the milk first and then we'll have to manage the cereal that's left in our mouth. So it just requires a bit more coordination and good breath control. Um, then you've got your crunchy and crumbly foods um, and your hard foods, so toast, um, crusts, anything that, um, that's dry, biscuits or crisps, um, boiled and chewy sweets, nuts and seeds, and finally your husks, so sweet corn, grains, granary bread. Okay. So I'm just going to stop my screen share in a minute and show you. Can you all see me again? Good. Okay. So I'm just going to show you um, how we can make a thick and drink. So this is the thickener that I most typically use and it's a Nutrisha product, Nutrilis Clear. Um, I don't know whether this is actually the right way around for you or not, but <laughs> it is. Okay, good. Um, it's important that the thickener is a clear product. So there's plenty of different brands, um, but they will all have a clear product. And this is a thickener that's made with xanthan gum. And that's um, something we find in a lot of our food and drink that we can buy in the supermarket. It's just a binding agent. So the powder binds to the water or binds to the drink that you're thickening and makes it to the desired consistency. Um, other thickening products um, will be a powder instead of a clear product and that is a starch based um, thickener and they do thicken they thicken the drinks well but um, if you imagine you've made a jug of gravy and you leave that jug of gravy on the side for half an hour or so it's going to get quite thick because they thicken over time so um, that also happens to the starch based thicken and drinks as well and it's not going to be pleasant to drink if you come back to that half an hour later. Um, the xanthan gum stays at the same consistency as it did at the start. You could leave it there for a couple of days and it would still be the same. And I might not recommend drinking it but um, it would it would still look the same and be the same consistency. Um, and it's also we have a um, enzyme in our saliva called amylase and that enzyme breaks down starch. So if we thickened a drink with starch, it would actually become thinner when we drink it. Whereas clear products are resistant to that amylase. So it stays the same consistency during the drinking process. So I'm just gonna show you how to thicken a drink. See if I can move my laptop a bit. I'll try not to um, spill anything anywhere as well. So, what I've got here, I've got my cup that I'll be drinking from, and I've got 200 millilitres of water, okay? So the measurements for each brand of thickener are different, but for this one, everything is in proportion to 200 millilitres. So I'll be making a level two drink here, and for that, for this brand in particular, I'm going to need two scoops. So I've got my scoop here, pop it into my dry cup. If I was going to put it into a wet cup, it would start thickening straight away um, and it would get quite lumpy. So I'm putting it into a dry cup that I'll be drinking from. So you can see on the back here, it has the level of fluid and how many scoops you need. And it will be different for different brands, but for level two, I need two scoops of this product. And I've got my fork, you can use a spoon as well. I'll be mixing with a fork today. I'm just going to put my 200 millilitres in and start mixing. So I'll mix it for about 30 seconds and then it will be the consistency after. Right, so I'm just going to leave that for 30 seconds and then it'll be ready and I'll show you the difference between um, a cup of water about thickener in that I've got here and this one and you'll be able to see that it moves slower um, with the aim of giving the person who's drinking it 
more time to manipulate the water and enough time for their swallow to respond to the drink so it goes down the way you want it to go okay so this is my water without any thickener okay and this is a level two okay so it's not it's not too thick but you can see that difference okay and it changes the color very slightly and it changes the consistency and that's what we're after but it's tasteless um, the xanthan gum doesn't taste the starch based thickness will have a sort of starchy taste like a sort of pasta water kind of taste so that's another reason why i'm more of an advocate for the clear base thickener all right Let me go back to my shared screen. Here we are. Okay. So there are various symptoms of WS that can lend themselves to um, disrupting the eating, drinking, and swallowing process. Um, if we think back to the four stages of the swallow that I described. Um, the pre-oral stage requires um, or utilizes your vision and your smell um, and optic atrophy is a symptom of Wolfram syndrome um, so that it can Im impact that stage a little bit. Um, ataxia as well so your movement can could disrupt sort of the physical act of eating and drinking bringing the food or drink to your mouth but also the coordination of the swallow itself and there are also um, a lot of people that I've spoken to in clinic um, who describe gastrointestinal issues um, this includes um, acid reflux which I will be coming on to next okay so what is reflux Reflux is the backflow of gastric juice and enzymes from the stomach into the esophagus um, and sometimes the throat as well. There are two main types of reflux, your gastroesophageal reflux, um, which is most commonly associated with heartburn and indigestion symptoms, and extraesophageal reflux. Um, which includes laryngopharyngeal reflux where it comes right up to your throat and can affect your throat and your voice. Okay, so this type of reflux can be known as silent reflux as many people don't experience the heartburn symptoms that are typically associated with um, reflux. And these symptoms may include um, an unpleasant taste in the mouth, sore throat, excess mucus in the throat and difficulty clearing that, um, the feeling of a lump or tightness around the throat area, regular coughing and throat clearing, dryness in the mouth or throat, and a hoarse voice. So the lining of the stomach is designed to cope with acid, but the esophagus and um, the linings of the throat, they're not designed for that. So um, there's a lot of things that we can do to help this. And alleviate symptoms. So this includes avoid eating late at night. Um, reflux is aggravated by bending, lying flat, lifting or straining. So eating before bedtime will encourage um, gastric backflow. So try to allow at least three hours between um, your last meal and lying down to go to sleep. Eating small frequent meals during the day um, can be beneficial to distribute the physical load on the stomach and minimise the risk of reflux. Um, sipping water between meals can help this as well. And just sit, taking time to sit and relax after a meal, um, making sure you're not up and about straight after you've finished. There are lots of foods that can make reflux worse, so avoiding these is um, useful. So this can include um, high fat foods, chocolate, prepared cakes, desserts, um, spicy foods, citrus fruit and mint. 
and food that is very hot or very cold in temperature can overstimulate um, the gastric musculature and increase the risk of reflux. Um, chewing gum can also be an irritant um, and something that, that a lot of people find helpful is keeping a food diary um, to identify any particular foods or eating habits which make their symptoms worse. Fizzy drinks, caffeinated drinks or highly acidic drinks such as fruit juice um, can aggravate reflux too, as can al alcohol, um, particularly white wine and spirits. Um, smoking is also an irritant um, and it increases your risk of developing reflux. Raising the head of the bed can be beneficial, so using pillows alone um, to raise your head can sort of cause your stomach to be become squashed um, and increase the risk of reflux. So if, if you're planning on raising the head of your bed, it's, it's best to put sort of blocks or bricks under, um, under your bed to raise it by about six inches or so. Okay. Um, Excess weight sort of around the stomach area can encourage backflow um, and reflux, um, as can tight clothing. Um, and I think the most important thing, if, if you've tried all of these sort of lifestyle changes um, and you're still experiencing these symptoms, it's, it's important to speak to your GP um, as they can um, provide more advice and, and perhaps prescribe some, some medicine to manage these symptoms. So um, they'll most likely prescribe a PPI um, or a proton pump inhibitor. And examples of this will be lanzoprazole or omeprazole, um, just to prevent the secretion of acid into the stomach. And there's also over-the-counter medications such as gaviscon um, that can be of use, but it's always important to speak to your GP about this as well. All right, so. Um, if any of this information is ringing any bells, um, I think the best, best course of action is contacting your GP um, or if, if anything comes up in the future. Um, you may have already seen myself or a colleague in um, clinic before, um, but if you, um, if you are concerned, contacting your GP um, is essential. But in the meantime, strategies that can be useful um, are taking small, steadily paced sips of fluid or mouthfuls of diet and trying not to talk straight after or during eating and drinking. Reducing distractions when eating and drinking, so television, radio, chatting away um, can, can be a distraction at mealtime. Um, if taking tablets is a bit difficult, it, this can be made easier by taking them with a spoonful of yogurt, for example. Um, and as I spoke about um, using a diary to detail reflux symptoms, it's also useful for um, noting down patterns of swallowing difficulty. Okay, so if you notice that any particular foods or drinks or scenarios um, commonly lead to difficulty with your swallow, then Avoiding these items or environments um, might be of help if, it, if this is practical. Okay, so that brings me to the end there. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, we can go through those now. Um, I'll just stop my screen share as well. There we go. Lovely. Thanks, Georgia. I, I found that really, really interesting. Um, it's helped me with understanding Jennifer's uh, swallow issues a little bit more oh, um, and we already have a pureed diet for her and mm -hmm. I've thickened like her hot chocolate with um, ready break um, oh, that helps thicken it uses yeah. she has chocolate flavored ready break and I add a couple of spoons of that into her um, hot chocolate and that oh, helps great her when she has to have her tablets in the morning so um so i use that as a thickener but um yeah. <laughs> it's another way um but yeah no that you know that's that was i thought that was really really interesting thank you so thank you very much we'll go to um questions um from any of our um participants if you've got anything hold your hand up and i'll flicking through my screen 
No questions. <laughs> oh, Dawn's got a question. Well, Dawn. Oh, yeah. So if if um, someone's having slight difficulty swallowing, mm. the thicker the liquid is better then, rather than thinner. That... It's, it always depends on the individual. Um, but if somebody would notice it, notice that they were having difficulty swallowing your normal fluid, and then tried a smoothie or a milkshake and that felt a bit easier, then it's quite likely in that situation that thickener would be beneficial. No. But it's not, it's not a um, blanket for everybody. No. Um, they would always need their own assessment, but um, it is typically the case that a thickened drink can be useful. Okay. Okay. And the, the, um, uh, the neutralist clear, is that something you can get over the counter or is it a special? I, it's normally prescribed by a GP. Right, okay. Um, I, I'm not sure whether or not you can get it over the counter. It's not something that I've seen. Um, mm. But it's, I mean, it's a product that's available to buy in supermarkets. You can buy tubs of xanthan gum for sort of cooking purposes. Oh, okay. So, but it's most typically prescribed. We'll always request GPs to prescribe it for people who need it. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry. Yep. Everyone's going to be raiding the baking aisle now. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a run on something gun in gun yeah. flour. <laughs> Anyone else? No. I think you're just so detailed. You had so much information in there. <laughs> um, I think you've probably sort of covered ev everything. Um, so say so if anyone does think of any questions afterwards um, or when they rewatch the um, video then obviously if they send me um, your que the questions and I I've got George's email and um, I can send them to her for so, um, so I think we can finish